Thank you for tuning in to our podcast, History's Top 3, brought to you by the History Department of the United States Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. In this show, we will discuss and debate some of the key turning points, trends, and major figures of world history. Our goal is to explore the varied landscapes and seascapes of the past in the hopes of shedding some light on the way the present world came to be. In our studio today, we have three co-hosts. Yours truly is Major Ben Brewster, an instructor here at the History Department. Uh, we also have Mr. Ross Phillips, uh, who currently works at Marine Corps History Division, and uh, Mr. Lawrence Nelson, who currently works for the Army, but we'll forgive you for it. All of us are lifelong students of history uh, and PhD candidates at Texas A&M University. In this episode, we will present our top three choices of today's theme. Today's theme is most unknown or underrated Marines. We will then discuss how we made our choices and why we believe they deserve a place in the top three. We invite you to share your thoughts and engage in the discussion. So without further ado, let's talk about history's top three underrated or underappreciated Marines. Uh, Let's start with hearing your nominations. Lawrence Nelson here, and uh, I'm nominating uh, Smedley Butler well-known by many Marines as being a rather interesting and entertaining figure. Um, And he was important in the development of the Marine Corps, and his career was at a very pivotal time. He joined the Marine Corps as a very young man uh, during the Spanish-American War. Uh, Didn't have a lot of combat experience there, but ended up being involved in the Boxer Rebellion and fighting his way through what we call the Banana Wars or the conflicts in the Caribbean that happened in the early 20th century. He was an important uh, leader during the Haiti campaign, uh, where he eventually uh, commanded the Gendarmerie, which was the uh, American-led Haitian constabulary there. Uh, And he was important in that role in the sense that he developed uh, political connections through his father, who was in the Senate and was on uh, an appropriations committee, was a leading member of the appropriations committee for uh, Navy appropriations. And um, he developed relationships with uh, senators and congressmen that he used to help support his mission. Uh, and, and he wrote letters to them often uh, explaining what the objective was in Haiti, uh, which was a state-building, nation-building mission at the time, and extolling the virtues and the values of the operation going, ongoing uh, at the time. Uh, he has a rapid change of heart at the exact moment that the United States gets involved in World War I, decides the campaign isn't worth fighting, and really, really wants to go to World War I, go fight in France. He uses his political connections to eventually get there, but unfortunately he doesn't get a front-line uh, command. He ends up running a depot, which he does a good job doing that, but uh, he's very disappointed by that. Uh, after that point, he's, he, he continues to be involved in important aspects of the Marine Corps. He, he ends up in China. And he does some political backdealing to help uh, General Lejeune get the commandancy eventually. Um, But it it ends up not being, because of World War I and his lack of military or combat experience there, he ends up not getting the commandancy and not getting opportunities that he wanted. So he ends up going more into American politics. He uh, writes a very important tract called War is a Racket, which explains that uh, he believes the U.S. operations in the Caribbean, the stabilization missions are imperialistic, and they're only to the they're only happening to advantage uh, Wall Street um, or the economic sector in the United States. Um, he he uses that to sort of create a platform for himself politically, uh, and then when the Great Depression hits, he's involved in um, the uh, the the GI movement to get the GI bill the the GI advancement of money earlier, uh, and he's he's a important speaker there. Uh, the thing that's really interesting at this point is that he's approached by a group of fascists, or at least according to him, he's approached by a group of fascist Americans who try to get him to lead the GIs to create their own sort of black shirt, which is a reference to Italian fascism, uh, essentially to use the uh, veterans as a military militia force to take control of the government so that they can install a fascist dictatorship in the United States. He takes this information in and then reports it to Congress immediately and exposes these people and and is able to testify before Congress. And so I would say that 
in that sense, in the in in his writing of important tracks and in his uh, foiling of a fascist plot, he's very important politically in the history of the United States. That's fascinating. Well, I'm looking forward to our uh, three-way discussion to ask you some more questions about that, but also to throw some things in that I've come across about him. Uh, I think uh, I think I'm going to jump in next. Uh, this is Major Ben Brewster, history instructor here at the academy. Uh, my underrated or underremembered figure is uh, Herman Henry Hanneken. We'll call him by the Triple H because I couldn't come across another tricky or fun nickname uh, that he had. But Herman Henry Hanneken enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1914, uh, but doesn't really make a name for himself uh, until 1919 when he participates uh, in the campaign in Haiti. And as an NCO, uh, he develops a really elaborate plot to try to capture uh, Peralte, who's the leader of the rebels in Haiti. And uh, ultimately, down to the day that they're, they're going to launch this operation against him, it kind of falls apart. Uh, and what he decides to do under, under the cover of darkness is he takes a number of hand-picked men, disguises himself as a rebel fighter, uh, arms himself with a pistol, and basically talks his way through the rebel lines, uh, comes up to Peralte around a fire pit and just shoots him in the face uh, and then fights his way out of, uh, out of the rebel camp. Um, if that's not already impressive enough, and that's he was awarded the Medal of Honor for that, so one would think that he's largely remembered in Marine Corps lore. He's he's really not. Um, he continues service uh, there in Haiti, and then the rest of his career is just fascinating. But the thing that's most fascinating about it to me is that in his transition from being an NCO to then a lieutenant in the gendarmerie, uh, to then being a commissioned officer in the Marine Corps, uh, he served as a bridge from really this old core uh, bandit fighting force that, Lawrence, you've just talked about, uh, that gets their experience in, in Haiti. Um, and he ends up doing shipboard service. And then 10 years later in the 1920s, he ends up uh, back down in Nicaragua. And he really pulls almost the same thing again against the Nicaraguan insurgency where he sneaks behind enemy lines. Uh, the language of the day was he brought in a rebel leader. He, he shoots him. Um, and it was impressive. It was impressive. Um, then as World War II starts to heat up, uh, he transitions out of kind of this insurgency, bandit-chasing world in the Caribbean, uh, and he finds himself as an active duty officer in one of the first offensive uh, operations of the war, and he's the battalion commander of 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines on the island of Guadalcanal when the 1st Marine Division goes in. Uh, and as a part of the fight for Henderson Field, um, as part of the defense there in really the early days of World War II, makes a name for himself as a really hard-bitten, hard-fought battalion commander. His Marines name the ridge that they defend after him, Hannikin's Ridge, uh, to, to the perimeter of the airfield there. Uh, and then after the Guadalcanal campaign, uh, he advances to become CO of 7th Marines. Uh, and this is where I'll at least wrap up my telling of him for now. We'll get more into some other details later. But the remarkable thing to me is that as the CO of 7th Marines on Peleliu, as a regimental commander uh, alongside 1st Marines CO Chesty Puller, uh, and then alongside 5th Marines, he really makes a name for himself as a regimental commander, and his regiment makes a name for themselves for sustaining about 50% casualties uh, fighting against uh, the Japanese defenses there. And uh, Peleliu was certainly a hard-fought battle uh, for the 1st Marine Division. Uh, it's been recorded in, uh, in really well-known books like Sledges with the Old Breed. Um, but the idea of now Colonel Hannikin being the guiding force behind this regiment that is just slamming into the Japanese defenses again and again and again. Uh, Chesty Puller is the one out of Peleliu that really ends up getting uh, history's bad rap um, for throwing his Marines against what becomes known as Bloody Ridge. Uh, but Hanneken, every bit as much, um, 
follows the same tactics. And what's remarkable to me, and I think what's unremembered about particularly this Marine officer, is his sense of just trying to get the mission done against all odds in any circumstance. And don't, don't give him excuses about how it can't be done or it's against all odds or we might not make it out alive. And it's phenomenal for me. It's at least it's interesting for me to consider how uh, a young NCO who cuts his teeth down in the Caribbean just doing absolutely seemingly impossible tasks like sneaking behind enemy lines uh, and either executing or capturing um, enemy leaders then wraps up his career as a regimental commander driving Marines into the teeth of Japanese defenses. So with that, we'll transition to our third unremembered or underappreciated Marine. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so I'll, I'll be bringing up the rear here uh, with a guy who I think uh, I think it's actually appropriate that he'll be here because he's kind of bridging the gap between the generation that has uh, that Ben and Lawrence have talked about and that I will talk about. So I'm Ross Phillips, uh, PhD candidate at Texas A&M and current Gridley Fellow at the Marine Corps History Division Archives. Uh, my pick is... Raymond G. Davis. Uh, admittedly, part of my love of Ray Davis is that he's a native Georgian, and I'm also a native Georgian. So he was born in Fitzgerald, Georgia. Um, grew up there. He attended Georgia Tech, which is unfortunate for me as I, I went to the University of Georgia, but I'll forgive him for it because he's that cool. Um, so he is going to commission into the Marine Corps in 1939. Uh, he actually resigned his commission. He was initially commissioned into the U.S. Army. He resigned his Army commission to take up a commission in the Marine Corps. Uh, and so he commissions into the Marine Corps, goes to the basic school, and his stru- instructor is none other than uh, Lewis Burwell Puller, Chesty Puller, uh, who teaches him about his experiences in Nicaragua and Haiti. And they're going to be very influential throughout his career uh, for Davis on how he chooses to fight uh, tactics and his beliefs on how operations should be executed. And that'll pop up here a little bit later when we get into the Q&A and then also just the description of his career. But really, Davis is at a lot of really important places in Marine Corps history throughout World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Um, And the first place he'll find himself is on Peleliu, actually, commanding uh, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. and he's going to be instrumental in establishing the beachhead there. And he actually, for his actions there, he receives the Navy Cross. Um, and this was kind of the first of many uh, awards that he would receive for, for valor. He's a, he's crazy brave, as you'll see throughout his, his career. Um, fast forwarding to another important point in Marine Corps history, Chosen Reservoir. Uh, he's also there, uh, I believe, with 7th Marines. Uh, and he, uh, for his actions at, at Tocton Pass, he's awarded the he uh, receives the Medal of Honor. And so he's uh, at these very two very important actions, and he be- goes on uh, throughout his career. And then once again, I'll pick up with him in Vietnam. He's a major general. He receives the assignment to be the commanding general of 3rd Marine Division on uh, 22nd of May, 1968. Uh, and he decides he's going to implement a new operational approach that he calls high mobility. He had been hanging out. Uh, with the 1st Air Cavalry Division prior to um, and had witnessed them employing air mobile tactics and how they were able to kind of pursue, pursue the enemy all over the place uh, and be very aggressive. And he it reminded him of the ideas Puller had instilled in him as a young Marine officer and that he had kind of utilized throughout his career. And so he decided to make an operational change and he instituted that change and it was perceived as wildly, wildly successful by the Marine Corps and the U.S. Army at the time. Um, and he wins a, a significant amount of praise, especially for Operation Dewey Canyon from January to March 1969. And that's going to be one of the things that the Marine Corps is really going to point at out of Vietnam that they can say this was a success. Now, uh, my own research has looked into this kind of narrative and, and challenged it a bit. But nevertheless, it is very influential for the Marine Corps and Marine Corps lore. Um, and then he's going to go on and I think kind of cement his legacy by becoming the commander of the Education Command uh, right after his assignment as 3rd uh, Marine Division Commander. 
And so I think this is how you can kind of see that Ray Davis is important, but he's not really remembered, but he's an important bridge from the guys of uh, what might be considered the old breed uh, to the Vietnam era and then now to the present as he kind of sets the tone, I think, for Education Command going into uh, what we would see as the modern Marine Corps. And so, yeah, and, and maneuver warfare, just as Lawrence uh, kind of whispered in very, very softly. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think that that's why Ray Davis is an important Marine that should be remembered, but is that often his influence is uh, kind of not recognized or it kind of runs as an undercurrent. So as we, as we transition to kind of a round the horn discussion about these three Marines, it occurs to me that and we could have just said, this was, Hey, let's talk about uh, medal of honor recipients and then, uh, and then talk about their influences beyond their medals of honor. But it is fascinating to me that here we have three medal of honor recipients, one twice, right. With Smedley Butler, but their impact both on the Marine Corps, on the United States, kind of our understanding of military history really goes far beyond the citations that we may or, or may not have been familiar with. Uh, so let's let's start off with two questions really quick, because I like this idea that it seems like has come out in all three, uh, how they were impacted as young Marines by older Marines. Uh, so Lawrence, if we, if we go to you first, maybe could you talk a little bit about uh, how Smedley's service in the old Corps, you know, I'm doing air quotations, he identifies um, very much so, doesn't have a college education. He is a hard scrabble Marine who loves enlisted Marines, but he's really the oldest one that we've talked about here. Could you maybe talk about how his rubbing shoulders with the old Corps, the Sea Service Marine Corps, uh, impacts his service um, up through uh, up through the Caribbean campaigns. Absolutely. So he uh, he served with Dan Daly on multiple occasions, and his CO in uh, Haiti was um, uh, uh, L.T. Waller, Littleton Waller, uh, who famously had led the Samar campaign. Yeah. And uh, he had served. So his experience, he he does become sort of known for being an anti intellectual Moraine. He scoffs at. Marines who spend too much time in military schools, as he as he says, and and likes to kind of make digs at them when he's talking years later about operational planning, specifically uh, uh, um, a, a young Marine named Utley, who eventually becomes a general, uh, who's very intellectual, very smart Marine, uh, is trying to plan a campaign in Haiti with him. And Utley says, well, we need a certain number of soldiers and, and a certain number of Marines in order to actually control this vast region. And basically, Butler's like, no, I just need to be more aggressive about it. Let me do it. And, and Waller sides with him. And they end up doing this long-range patrolling in, in Haiti that's fairly successful. Ends up being so successful that the Secretary of the Navy tells them to stop going around killing so many Haitians um, because it's, it looks bad in the press. Uh, so anyway, he's very much connected to that side of the Marine Corps' history. What's ironic about that is he's the one who through some back-channeling, gets General Lejeune, the commandancy, who's well-known for trying to get the Marines to be more educated and more professional. Um, so it's it's kind of this twist on on the culture a little bit. And and incidentally, that we're sitting here at the United States Naval Academy. I mean, that is, uh, that is a tangible influence of the Naval Academy on the Marine Corps and, and certainly uh, General Lejeune's influence on, on the Corps that now we're, we're going to talk about. Uh, with Hannikin and um, and Davis, um, Ross, maybe over to you. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk maybe about how Davis's experience? You mentioned him being trained by Chesty Puller, uh, coming in as a as a young lieutenant at the beginning of the war. Could you maybe talk about the same impact or influence of how do these um, Banana War veterans influence him, both in World War II and then in the rest of his career? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so with with Davis and Puller, he's really kind of uh, taken by Puller and, and the way he describes operations, and he gives him very harrowing, gives the Marines that he's training very harrowing accounts of these patrols that he's been on in Nicaragua and, and, and Haiti, and Nicaragua especially, I think, is probably the big one. Um, 
And it's really going to influence uh, Davis and the way he thinks about operations because uh, Puller is going to stress to his Marines being aggressive, uh, constantly being in the field, uh, constantly pursuing the enemy, not letting them rest. And this is something that's going to make a really big impression on, on Davis, especially when he's kind of he comes into contact with air mobility in Vietnam and he starts thinking, okay, well, Maybe that we should use this concept to our advantage. Maybe we can adapt this so the Marine Corps can use it in Vietnam. And he's really taken with this idea because he sees it as a way, the helicopter especially, as a way to constantly pursue the enemy, uh, a way to constantly be on the offensive and pursue uh, and exploit uh, maneuver and things like that. And so really, um, Puller's influence in this generation of, of Banana Wars veterans, these Banana War Marines, uh, is really on his kind of the way he thinks about operations and very much instilling this offensive mindset and this uh, emphasis on being in the field and constantly pursuing the enemy, not letting him rest. Uh, but really, I think the biggest takeaway is being on the offensive. Well, that uh, certainly for Hannikin, uh, that fits the mold for him, both his understanding of uh, in Haiti, we're just going to get the mission done, even if it means sneaking through the jungle and shooting Peralta in the face, uh, which I don't, I'm actually looking at Lawrence. I don't know if he actually shot him in the face, but it sounds good to say. Uh, no, uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting the signs here that maybe they were, uh, they were center mass wounds. But apparently uh, the PR campaign kind of backfired because he circulated pictures to prove that Peralta was dead, but then it actually developed sympathy for him. Um, yeah. something I something have some like opinions that. on that. So I, I think it backfires, but it also is successful. So it does create sympathy, and it's become sort of this Christ-like image in Haitian culture since then because he's got him leaning against a door, uh, against a wall and a door, kind of in only a loincloth with his arms kind of apart. So he's got this sort of almost Christus image, yeah. which is rather an, an unfortunate aspect of, of the picture. But it does, I think, very effectively demoralize the Kako rebels. Uh, because they're more or less defeated not long after, after Botraville, who's the guy who takes over the mantle from Peralt uh, not long later, uh, is also killed by a, an aggressive Marine Corps NCO. And that one is actually de- dispatched um, in by a shot through the head. Fun fact, uh, if you're interested in seeing the actual service revolver uh, that Hannikin used, the Marine Corps Museum has it down in Quantico. Um, uh, but that's that's a separate story. What's remarkable to me is that this idea of just figure it out, just get it done, uh, translates into Guadalcanal, where um, you know, the 1st Marine Division, they land, they're able to take the airfield, but the idea of whether or not the 1st Marine Division is actually going to survive, whether or not they're actually going to be cut off and surrounded by the Japanese, is it largely comes down to... Um, the battalions that are there fighting it out. And it's interesting because uh, we talk about the influence of these Marines on each other. Uh, You've got uh, Hannikin serving as the battalion commander of 2-7 alongside Chesty Puller, who's the CO of 1-7. And then once they've fought their way out of that campaign, uh, them then both transitioning up to the regimental level uh, with Polar taking over First Marines and Hanneken, Seventh Marines, and now they're side by side on Peleliu. That mindset of, well, it's hard and we're taking a lot of casualties, but there's no other way around it. There's no fancy way to do it. I think uh, maybe what you mentioned, Lawrence, even about Smedley Butler saying, no, we don't have to plan this well. We just have to try harder. We just yeah. have to get it done. Uh, you certainly get that sense of desperation um, reading. Um, reading the accounts, and I think um, is it uh, is it Davis's book, um, Rifleman. Is that his book? I believe it. It might be Marine Rifleman. Yeah, that's Wesley Fox. So Wesley Fox yeah. serves under Davis, though right. in Third Marine Division. There is a gr- so. thank you, thank you for the yeah. correction. I feel like we're almost in a prep for comps discussion here. <laughs> there's a great there's a great passage out of Marine Rifleman that talks about the infantry advance up um, up Bloody Nose Ridge at Peleliu that talks about this idea of the riflemen. The, the verbiage is they stabbed and clubbed their way to the top. Um, and this idea of when you have officers from this background and this training that are driving their units to say, 
Uh, there's, there's no simple way to do this, and we're going to take casualties, and we just have to get it done because we have to root out the Japanese, and there's no way off this island until we do so. Um, in hindsight, they borne the brunt of a lot of historical criticism about being uh, hard-nosed or attritionist or butchers, but we can see from their standpoint looking forward, they just said, hey, what we have to do is try harder. Absolutely. I think that also ties into the way they delegated authority down. That was a, another tradition, a story tradition from that generation. Um, Red Mike Edson was also there at Guadalcanal leading uh, on Edson's Ridge, obviously. And so I, I think that's a very important moment in Marine Corps history, uh, Guadalcanal, and its connection to the Nicaragua, Haiti, and Dominican Republic campaigns specifically, where they had learned how to fight in the bush. And Nicaragua, especially, where they learned how to fight in the bush against an enemy with near-peer weaponry, fighting against guys with BARs, Thompsons, and Lewis guns. And they had learned that you just have to slog it out, hit them on the, hit them on the flanks, and keep on going. That was something that Polar and Edson both had to learn uh, in their time in Nicaragua. Um, so I do think that's an important aspect of it. And it does harken back to... Smedley Butler and the way he led uh, offensive operations in Haiti and the way Waller led offensive operations in Samar and the way that they had to learn to fight uh, even before that when they were with the fleet is they would be dropped off in these locations with minimal instructions and just have to figure it out, young junior officers. So I think that's a long story tradition within the Marine Corps of, of how they had to learn to deal with the, the negative situations they were given. How do, maybe as we wrap up here, let's talk briefly about what's the legacy, um, both of, uh, of these officers as Marines, uh, but their legacy to really the history of the Marine Corps uh, and the way that we remember it? That's a great question. I think a little bit on the way I think about that is I, I see uh, Marine Corps intellectual history and its constant patterns of Rever reversions to certain tactical applications as a tr as a tradition of genealogy. So we've talked about this a lot already. How does Ray Davis connect back to Chesty Puller? How does Chesty Puller back contact back to Herman Hannigan and uh, Smedley Butler, who contacts back to other Marines of previous times? Uh, because the Marine Corps has a uniquely small size over its history, uh, and its officer cadre remains fairly small over time. It's it has much more of a genealogical intellectual history. And so their influence, you can see it one by one. Who's CO is who's CO, and how much influence does he have over that next generation of leaders who are specifically trained by him and led by him, and they gain life lessons and leadership lessons from that leader, and, and they gain military experience under his tutelage. And I think that's an important aspect of what we've talked about mm -hmm. and, and how the Marine Corps learns generation to generation. As I, as I contemplate that and kind of that handoff, it's remarkable for me with Hanneken, who ultimately ends the war as a colonel. Uh, after Peleliu, he gives up command of 7th Marines, and he heads back to the States. And what he's asked to do by the Marine Corps is run the infantry, the West Coast Infantry Training Regiment that is then pumping out all of the, essentially all the privates that are then going to go and invade Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And so he's directly responsible for running that schoolhouse, those training camps. Uh, and then he retires in uh, 1948 uh, as a brigadier general. But his influence, his influence really is, at that point, uh, it's been recycled back to that junior level Marine, junior NCO that he started as. Uh, as the war ends up and then the Marine Corps moves forward. But, Ross, how about you, especially with Davis being the one that kind of carries us closest to the future? Well, I think what Lawrence said with about kind of the genealogical aspect of it is a really good way to put it because, I mean, I think when you look at it, you see, like you said, the connections between kind of all these individuals and how they're almost all in somewhat of a similar line, if not the same line. Um and then I think with, with Davis specifically, it's like I said earlier, not to sound like a broken record, but it's bridging the gap. It's bringing continuity to the this kind of generation of Marines, bridging that gap and bringing it to the Marine of, you know, the Vietnam era, the post-Vietnam era, because Davis is going to be the, the commander of the Education Command after Vietnam as well. And so I think it's... Uh, it's really, I think that's a really good way to put it, though, and I think that that's kind of 
Davis's kind of importance as well as it's kind of this educational continuity or this kind of thought continuity, intellectual continuity may be the best way to think about it um, and kind of bridging that gap. Well, uh, there's plenty more that we could discuss or debate on this subject, but we'll save that for a round of drinks between friends. From all of us here at the U.S. Naval Academy and particularly the History Department, thanks for tuning in. This has been a production of the History Department at the U.S. Naval Academy, located in Annapolis, Maryland. If you enjoy our programs, please let us know as we'd love to hear your thoughts. You can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at USNA History. And our email is historyproductions-group at usna.edu. For more information about the History Department at the Naval Academy, please visit usna.edu history.